हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा World leaders are in New York for the United Nations General Assembly and all the focus seems to be on the two wars that have been uh, that are being fought uh, in fact in, between Ukraine and Russia and uh, and in West Asia and that's what world leaders seem to be talking about there's a lot of politics meetings and statements Putin is making nuclear threats that he'll fire nukes in response to conventional weapons Biden is giving more arms to Ukraine he has promised another package France and the UK want a ceasefire in Lebanon but Netanyahu is in no mood to slow down we'll bring you all the updates and the implications meanwhile China is offering cash handouts to the poor to fire up its economy in India 50 drugs including paracetamol and pan d that are sold in the market have been found to be of poor quality In Canada, Justin Trudeau survives a no-confidence motion, the first of many to come. Also in India, the defense industry has hit another record. It seems that make in India is slowly but surely paying off. We'll do a deep dive. Back in the US, another Hindu temple has been vandalized. This is what you get when you patronize anti-India groups like the Khalistanis. In West Asian politics, the realignment seems to be underway. The US has designated the UAE as its major defense partner, not Saudi Arabia. The West has sued the Taliban at the International Court of Justice. It's among the most useless of their PR stunts. And the Sahara Desert is turning green. Should the world celebrate or worry about this? We'll discuss the headlines first. Japan sends a warship through the Taiwan Strait for the first time it joins ships from Australia and New Zealand on a patrol the move comes after China ramps up military activity in the region Beijing says it's lodged a strong complaint with Tokyo Russia and Ukraine to exchange 13 displaced children the move comes after mediation by Qatar Russia has been accused of forcibly deporting children since the war began Ukraine says some 20000 children have been taken to Russia Gold prices hit an all-time high. It's at 76,000 rupees for 10 grams in India. A weaker dollar and interest rate cuts are driving the surge globally. Geopolitical instability is also adding to the demand. Gold is often seen as a safe haven bet asset. Sudan's army launches major offensive in the capital Khartoum. Aiming to regain areas held by the paramilitary rapid support forces, Sudan has been embroiled in war since 2023 more than 150000 people have been killed more than 10 million remain displaced hong kong jails two journalists for sedition they were found guilty last month in a landmark case both of them had published articles on the crackdown on civil liberties in the city this is the first sedition case against journalists in hong kong since 1997 Thousands protest in Spain for shorter working hours. The government too wants to reduce working time from 40 hours a week to 37.5. Spain believes it will boost productivity, but business associations are blocking the move. лунные редакции хорошо хорошо это наш цель если бы это было бы диаметр полевого столба составлял около will vladimir putin go nuclear The Russian president is making fresh threats. Today he sent another warning to the West. Putin says if Russia is attacked, it reserves the right to respond with nuclear weapons. Listen to this. We reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in the event of aggression against Russia and Belarus as a member of the Union state. All these issues have been agreed upon with the Belarusian side, with the president of Belarus, including if the enemy using conventional weapons creates a critical threat to our sovereignty. Putin has made such threats before. 
So what's the big deal about this one? Why is it making headlines? Because Putin is redefining Russia's red lines. He has revised the country's nuclear doctrine for the second time in four years, and it sends a clear message to Ukraine and its Western backers. If Russia is attacked by any conventional weapon, if it detects any incoming, incoming attack, whether it's missiles, drones, or aircraft, Russia could respond with nuclear weapons. That's the message in a nutshell. We will consider such a possibility as soon as we receive reliable information about a massive launch of aerospace attack means and their crossing of our state border, meaning strategic or tactical aircraft, cruise missiles, drones, hypersonic missiles and other aircraft. You may have heard of the no first use policy with respect to nuclear weapons. It basically means that you won't fire nuclear weapons first. No first use. You'll only resort to nukes when you come under a nuclear attack yourself. India follows this policy. A lot of countries do, but Russia is evidently junking it. It says it will use nuclear weapons in the event of any attack, nuclear or conventional. The question is why? Why is Putin issuing this threat now? Well, he's responding to Ukraine's attacks inside Russia. The incursion in Kursk. In August, Ukrainian troops captured parts of the region, the Kursk region, and they now claim to control territory here, along with some 100 Russian settlements. They're in Ukrainian control. Now, this offensive has emboldened Zelensky. He wants to launch a bigger offensive. He's been pushing his Western partners to support Putin his plans. Zelensky wants to use Western missiles in this operation, like the British-made Storm Shadow missile and the American Attackum system. Both are long-range missiles. They can be used to strike deep inside Russia. The West is yet to make up its mind on letting Ukraine use these weapons. But Putin seems to be preempting the threat. So if Ukraine hits Russia with a missile or any other long-range weapon, he says he might retaliate with a nuclear attack. That is the warning from Vladimir Putin. And Russian mouthpieces have been amplifying it. For the past few weeks, they've been discussing war scenarios. Where could Russia deploy its nukes? How would it showcase its capabilities? And one of the options being discussed is this. For Russia to build replicas of Western cities like London and Washington, D.C., these would feature mock-ups of famous landmarks like the Buckingham Palace, the Big Ben and the White House. Then they would be destroyed by nukes. An expert from a Russian think tank gave this idea. He made these comments on Russian TV. So the nuclear rhetoric is getting louder. And Zelensky is raising an alarm. He says there will be an escalation from Russia and that Putin is gearing up to, to strike Ukraine's energy infrastructure, specifically its four nuclear plants. Now Putin does seem to be planning attacks on our nuclear power plants and their infrastructure. Any missile or drone strike, any critical incident in the energy system could lead to a nuclear disaster. Zelensky, as you can see, is in the U.S. He addressed the United Nations uh, General Assembly yesterday. He also met U.S. President Joe Biden. He is using this trip to build support for a victory plan, the details of which remain scarce, but it's basically a push for more military support and more security guarantees. Joe Biden has just a few months left in office. So Zelensky is perhaps hoping to extract as much as he can from the Americans. Will Biden support his victory plan? We don't know that yet. But Zelensky is not leaving the U.S. empty-handed. He is getting more military aid, worth $8 billion this time. This includes more weapons and military equipment. And this should be enough to sustain Ukraine at least till the end of Biden's term. But after that, after Biden's term in office, Ukraine's fate looks uncertain. If Kamala Harris wins, Zelensky can hope for some continuity. If Donald Trump wins, all bets are off. So Zelensky is trying to trump-proof Ukraine. How? By winning more friends. And his hopes rest on India, among others. A new report came out yesterday. It said that Ukraine is counting on India's help to broker peace with Russia. The story refers to Prime Minister Modi's recent engagements with Zelensky. They've met at least thrice in four months. First at the G7 in Italy in the month of June. Then in August when Modi tra traveled to Kiev. And then earlier this week when they met in New York. They discussed a potential peace deal. And apparently this was Prime Minister Modi's advice to Zelensky. If he wants the war to end, he should be open to compromise. That's what Modi said to have told Zelensky. Be open to a compromise. The report does not spell out what that compromise could look like. Remember, India has refused to support any peace deal which involves Ukraine giving up its territory. 
And this has been Ukraine's position too, not conceding land to Russia. Perhaps that's why Ukraine sees India as one of the few reliable mediators in the conflict. But would Russia agree to this? Is it ready to negotiate on these terms? Putin's nuclear rhetoric does not inspire confidence. Time to leave is now. The advice has been for many months now, please leave. Let's turn to West Asia now, where Benjamin Netanyahu faces a familiar choice, ceasefire or all-out war. He chose war last year and looks like he's choosing the same again. Israel has launched another round of strikes on Lebanon. Reports say 72 people were killed, which brings the death toll, the total death toll, to more than 620. This is how it started in Gaza too. First, relentless aerial bombardment and then a ground offensive. Israel's army chief has already hinted at it. You hear the jets overhead. We have been striking all day. This is both to prepare the ground for your possible entry and to continue degrading Hezbollah. Today, Hezbollah expanded its range of fire, and later today, they will receive a very strong response. Prepare yourselves. Hezbollah is also hitting back. They have fired dozens of rockets at Israel. They also targeted Israel's spy agency, Mossad, but the damage is limited. Only two injuries have been reported so far. If there is an all-out war, that would obviously change. Hezbollah claims to have 100,000 fighters, 1 lakh fighters. They also have 150,000 rockets, plus Iranian ballistic missiles. Most of this arsenal is stored underground. Hezbollah has also built a network of tunnels to move around and communicate. Basically, they've been preparing for this, for an assault from Israel. We saw that in 2006 as well. Israel and Lebanon fought a 34-day war in 2006, and Hezbollah fighters held on for a ceasefire. In other words, Israel could not win that war. But the cost of such a face-off is huge. Nearly 1 million Lebanese were displaced in 2006. The war cost them $2.8 billion. It cost Israel $1.6 billion. And this time, even Iran may join in. They already have a score to settle with Israel. And now is the perfect time. Israel is politically isolated. It is also fighting a two-front war. Tehran's foreign minister has already issued a warning. Iran firmly upholds its inherent right to defend its vital interests. And finally, Iran will not remain indifferent in case of a full-scale war in Lebanon. We stand with the people of Lebanon with all means. 2006 was bad, 2024 could be worse which is why the world is calling for de-escalation. The US and France are pushing a 21-day ceasefire deal, sort of like a temporary truce. The hope is to use this period to figure out something permanent, to diffuse the tensions. Around 12 countries are supporting the ceasefire. We put out a statement for a 21-day ceasefire along the Israeli-Lebanese border. We were able to generate significant support from Europe, as well as the Arab nations support this war not widen. We must not. We cannot have a war in Lebanon. There cannot be a war in Lebanon. This is why we urge Israel to cease this escalation in Lebanon and to we urge Hezbollah to cease the missile launches to Israel. There's one problem though. This isn't binding on Israel. It's just a joint statement by 12 countries. If you're expecting Israel to abide by that, you clearly do not know Netanyahu. So what about a binding statement? Maybe something from the United Nations Security Council. How about that? Well, France and Britain did propose that, but the U.S. shot it down. They had some issues with the wording of the proposal, so Washington killed it. As for this new proposal, Israel has already rejected it. 
Look at what their foreign minister said, and I'm quoting, there will be no ceasefire in the north. We will continue to fight against the terrorist organization Hezbollah. It's funny how he specified the north. It's not like Israel is championing a ceasefire in the south or anywhere, in fact. They have ignored every single stakeholder in this war. The United Nations, the Arab states, their own allies and partners, everyone is asking Israel to stop now, yet Netanyahu is doing the opposite. So a lot of countries are preparing for the worst. They're asking citizens to leave Lebanon. The US and Britain have deployed troops to the region. They say it's to help with evacuations. Turkey is preparing to do the same. So are India and Australia. The Indian Embassy in Beirut has issued three advisories in 48 hours. Three advisories in 48 hours. The latest one is asking Indians to leave Lebanon immediately. China too has done the same. So none of the signs are good for the world. But for Netanyahu, they're great. This is exactly what he wants. His war in Gaza is not popular among Israelis, but a war in, with Hezbollah would be popular. You see, 70,000 Israelis have been displaced from the northern parts of Israel, from northern Israel, and they can only return if Hezbollah is quiet. So most Israelis support a war in the north. We'll have more clarity in the coming days. Netanyahu has arrived in New York. He's expected to address the UN General Assembly on Friday. Even in peacetime, his speeches are dramatic. So expect something over the top. But today, it was Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's turn. He's 88 years old, but at the United Nations General Assembly, he was animated and defiant. Abbas accused Israel of carrying out a genocide. He also vowed that Palestinians would never leave their land. We will not leave. We will not leave. We will not leave. Palestine is our homeland. It is the land of our fathers, our, our grandfathers. It will remain ours. And if anyone were to leave, it would be the occupying usurpers. Netanyahu is in the same city as his allies and rivals. It's a great chance for a diplomatic solution to sit down and talk things out. But frankly, there is little hope. Temperatures are running very high at the moment. So diplomacy is certainly not on Netanyahu's mind. Nonetheless, we'll be tracking these things closely for you. Now let's talk about China. It's been a big week for them on the economic front. A few days ago, China announced a major stimulus aimed at reviving the property sector and the stock market. Yesterday, they made another announcement. Beijing will provide cash handouts to the poor. And they're making a big deal out of it. Next Tuesday, the Communist Party will celebrate its 75th anniversary. And on this day, China observes a national holiday, October 1st. And this time, Beijing has issued special instructions to the local authorities. They must release the handouts before Tuesday so that the people can truly celebrate. Let me quote from the government order. It says the handout will demonstrate, and I'm quoting, the party and the government's love and care for the people in need. This will be a one-time cash handout. And who are the people who will get it? How much money will they get? China is being cagey with the specifics. And this is not new, neither the caginess nor the cash handouts. In fact, cash handouts are more common in China than you would imagine. Beijing has a large budget for it. At the beginning of this year, China had set aside some $22 billion for all kinds of financial assistance and subsidies, $22 billion. Every month, 40 million Chinese citizens get what is called a subsistence allowance. This is financial support for basic needs like food, housing and health care. On average, the allowance is about 779 yuan for urban China. That's roughly 110 US dollars. And for those living in rural areas, they get 615 yuan or around 87 US dollars. Now, what's the purpose of this allowance? To guarantee what they're calling a minimum standard of living so that these 40 million Chinese nationals can, can have that minimum standard of living. And this group is the ideal target group for that one-time cash handout. Some local governments are going beyond this group, though, like, like in Shanghai. It plans to distribute coupons to locals. 
These can be used for dining, hotels and movies. Shanghai is printing coupons worth 522 million yuan. That's more than 70 million US dollars. But why is China giving so many subsidies? Because it wants to lift the economy out of its slumber. People are not spending enough. The demand for goods has plummeted. Beijing wants to change that. We should be aware that the adverse impacts arising from the changes in the external environment are increasing. Effective demands remain insufficient at home, and the sustained economic recovery is still confronted with multiple difficulties and challenges. That's why direct benefit transfers make sense. Economists have been pushing Beijing for this. One of the experts to make the suggestion was Huang Yiping. He serves as an advisor to China Central Bank. That's the People's Bank of China. Huang had pitched for cash handouts too, and he made the suggestion way back in the month of May, almost four months back. For the longest time, China has ignored such suggestions. It has hesitated in issuing any direct support, and it has cracked down on the critics of its economic policy. In fact, recently, one economist went missing. Apparently, he'd criti criticized Xi Jinping and his economic policies, and it wasn't even a public statement. This economist shared his thoughts in a private message on WeChat. WeChat is a Chinese messaging app. That's where he, he shared his thoughts on a, a private message, but his message seems to have caught the eye of Chinese censors because this economist has not been seen in public since April. We hope he's safe, but we cannot be sure. People who disappear in China either do not resurface at all or do as mere shadows of their former selves. And while Beijing has been going after such critics, it has also been forced to take their suggestions because there's no other way to boost growth. Having said that, do not expect major shifts here. These stimulus measures are a one-time move. And there is no shift in policy when it comes to dealing with criticism. You shall face the wrath of the state. If you live in India, you know this. No matter what your disease, you'll be offered one solution. Pop a paracetamol. It doesn't matter what you're suffering from. A lot of Indians treat paracetamol as a magic drug, one that can cure any and all ailments. So if you're one of them, if you pop a paracetamol like there's no tomorrow, this story is for you. The CDSCO has come out with a new report. That's the Central Drug Standard Control Organization. It is India's top drug regulator. And this is what the report says. More than 50 drugs in India are not of standard quality. More than 50 types of medicines are of poor quality. This includes everyone's favorite paracetamol, PAN-D, popular antibiotics, medicines for diabetes and high blood pressure, and supplements like calcium and vitamins. Basically, most of the commonly used drugs they're of poor, poor quality, not safe to consume, for various reasons. There's substandard manufacturing practices, lack of quality control, or even contamination. Then there's a level of active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. That's what they're commonly called, APIs. Every drug has them. But in these drugs, the substandard ones, the API levels are inconsistent. What does that mean for you? It means that the drugs can be quite dangerous. Instead of helping treat your ailment, they may be harming you. In the best case scenario, poor quality drugs are ineffective. They will not treat your condition. In the worst case scenario, they could lead to side effects that further aggravate your problem. Imagine you have a fever. You take a paracetamol of substandard quality. So it doesn't help control your fever. Instead, you develop other issues like maybe a headache or an allergic reaction. So basically, instead of solving the problem, the medicine makes it worse. And prolonged use can damage your kidneys and liver. So who's to blame for these drugs? The regulator found this through random sampling. It was done in multiple states. So obviously, the first suspect was the manufacturers, the pharma companies who make these medicines. But they have denied any involvement. Of course, they have. Some of them have also issued clarifications. They say that they did not even manufacture the drugs. They're calling them spurious. Basically, the companies are saying that the medicines are fake. And it's not the first such instance. Last year, the drug regulator released another such report. It mentioned contamination in popular medicines, including cough syrup. In June this year, the regulator inspected 400 manufacturing units and 36% of them had to be shut down because of quality issues. They did not meet manufacturing standards. And now there's this report 
It's not helping India's pharma industry. India is known as the world's pharmacy. We supply 20% of the world's generic drugs. We are the third largest drug maker by volume. We are a leading manufacturer of vaccines. In 2023, India's pharma industry was worth over $60 billion. But poor quality and unsafe drugs threaten to taint this reputation. The need of the hour is stringent inspections, better quality management, and stricter regulation. But all of those are long-term solutions. What can you do as a customer now? Well, if you, if you must take medicines every day, check for authenticity. Most drugs have a certification. It can be from the ISO, that's the International Organization for Standardization, or the WHO, that's the World Health Organization. Check for that. And for the others, unless your doctor prescribes it, stop popping pills like candy. It's not healthy. Every minor headache or cold does not need a medicine. It only builds up drug resistance. So you're doing yourself more harm than good. Our next story is about Canada. The country is led by Justin Trudeau. He is the prime minister and he's quite unpopular. He runs a minority government with outside support from other political parties. But if he were to hold, we were to hold elections today in Canada, he would be out. So you can imagine how relieved Trudeau was after he survived a no-confidence motion yesterday. Canada's main opposition party is gunning for him, but Justin Trudeau has managed to stay afloat, for now anyway. It's a story of desperation, defiance and good old political opportunism. Our next report has the details. Mr. Poilievre, seconded by Mr. Nader, moved that the House has no confidence in the Prime Minister and in the government. Yes, poor, 120, 120, 211, just our own. Je déclare la motion rejetée. And with that, Justin Trudeau could breathe a sigh of relief. The motion to oust him was defeated. He managed to cling on to power, at least until the next no confidence motion. That might take place in the next few hours, because Canada's Conservative Party is quite relentless. They want elections now. The Conservatives are leading in opinion polls by a massive margin. They were leading Trudeau's Liberals by 21 points a few days ago. So, if the elections were held today, Trudeau would be out. Canadian citizens have had enough of him over the last nine years. His approval rating has tanked from about 63% when he was first elected to about 28% this June. His party was polling even lower, at about 22% this month. This explains the slew of no-confidence motions lined up by Canada's Conservatives. But these motions are unlikely to succeed. The best chance for the Conservatives to win power would likely come in October. That's the official deadline for Trudeau to hold elections. And he's desperate to stay on until then. Trudeau probably knows he's losing, and he understands that his government is in a precarious position. He doesn't hold a parliamentary majority. His Liberal Party is 16 seats short of the halfway mark. He came back to power in the last election thanks to a coalition between his Liberal Party and Canada's New Democratic Party, led by Jagmeet Singh. But Singh abandoned Trudeau earlier this month, partially. Singh ended their formal coalition, but he says he will continue to back Trudeau during no-confidence motions. Why? Because Singh is unpopular too. If an election were held today, Jagmeet Singh's New Democratic Party would probably end up in the opposition. The Canadian Conservatives could come to power with a full majority. That means Singh won't be left with any political leverage. There's a third party that's backing Trudeau as well a party based in Canada's French-speaking Quebec province, called the Bloc Québécois. The Bloc has its own agenda, like increasing pensions and getting concessions for dairy farmers in Quebec. The Bloc has issued an ultimatum to Trudeau. It says that it would pull support if the government does not back its proposals. That would leave Trudeau entirely at Singh's mercy. As you can see, Trudeau is desperate to survive. The smaller parties are keen to extract their pound of flesh. And the whole lot seem to be defying the will of the Canadian people.
So, despite conservative party efforts, it looks like the people of Canada will have to wait for a while before they can show Trudeau the door. India's defense industry has hit a new milestone, 1.27 lakh crores in output, which is around $15 billion. Now, this is a big deal for India because we've always been a defense importer. Fighter jets, missiles, bullets, tanks, you name it, India imported it. But the new goal is to turn away from imports to, be, to first become self-reliant and then to export to the world. In that context, this milestone is very important. It was achieved in the last financial year. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh celebrated it on social media. He attributed the success to the Make in India program. He said India now exports to 90 countries, 9-0. We've told you about the big ones, like the BrahMos missile sold to the Philippines or the rocket system sold to Armenia. But that's not the full story. India's defense industry is large and complex. So tonight, let's do a deep dive. Who are the big players? What do they make? And who's buying it? Broadly speaking, there are three players. First is the government-owned producers. There are 16 DPSUs, or Defense Public Sector Undertakings. 16. You may have heard of HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, or the Mazagaon Dock Shipbuilders. These are DPSUs. They dominate India's defense industry. They also make the big toys, like fighter jets and warships. The second group is the private sector. They were allowed to produce defense goods in 2001. You need a license to make weapons in India. Today, the private players make up 20% of the output. Some 369 companies are in play. This includes the likes of Tata, Mahindra, and Bharat Forge. You also have small and medium-sized companies, around 14,000 of them, plus 329 defense startups, which brings us to the final group, joint ventures like Brahmos, which is half Russian. And where do these companies produce? Well, the government has set up two defense corridors in India. One is in Tamil Nadu, the other is in Uttar Pradesh. The UP corridor has got investments worth $3 billion and Tamil Nadu worth $1.4 billion. These companies mostly produce small items like firearms or lasers or protective gears or drones or helmets. And who buys them? Well, get ready for a surprise. The United States is the biggest export destination. Nearly 50% goes to the U.S. Some of it feeds the U.S. manufacturing line. Consider Tata and Boeing. They have a joint venture in Hyderabad. It produces parts for multiple Boeing aircraft, like the Apache helicopter. While this is good, it's not enough, because the real money lies in the big toys, like your fighter jets and helicopters, ships and missiles. So far, only one country has bought the Brahmos, and no one has bought the Tejas fighter jet. Many countries have expressed interest in both, but deals are yet to be struck. Now, to be fair, the Indian government is lobbying for it. They have appointed defense attaches to new countries, especially in the global south. These countries are looking for affordable yet lethal weapons, so India senses an opportunity here. But what about domestic demand? India is the fourth largest defense spender in the world. We spend $83 billion on defense. Why not use that money to buy Indian weapons? That's what some defense companies are asking. Recently, India placed an order for American rifles, around 73,000 SIG patrols. Now, Indian companies do make such firearms, so some of them question the move, like Bengaluru's SSS defense which makes you wonder, why does this happen? If India won't buy Indian-made weapons, why would anyone else? It's a question to think about. At the same time, we must say this, that this is an issue of national security. It's not like producing laptops or smartphones. We're talking about weapons. So indigenization cannot come at the cost of security. We must adopt a bottom-up approach, encourage defense startups, attract more foreign investments, and focus on joint ventures. Basically, set a strong foundation for this industry. The U.S. and Russian defense complexes were not built overnight. They were painstakingly created over wars and hardships. So there is time for India. The key is to do it right, not fast. Now let's turn our attention to the United States, the so-called land of the free that claims to champion freedom of expression, so much so that hate crimes get a free reign as well. I say this because another temple has been targeted in America. 
BAPS Swaminarayan Temple in Sacramento, the capital of California. The temple walls were covered with a disturbing message, Hindus go back. This threat was spray painted and the building's water pipes were damaged. This is the second such incident in the last 10 days. Last week, a BAPS temple was targeted in New York. This was just days ahead of India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the US. American lawmakers condemned the attack. India too sent a strong message. Yet, systemic hate persists in the US. Here's a report. Another temple has been targeted in the United States. The BAP Swami Narayan Temple in Sacramento, the capital of California. It happened last night. The temple was vandalized and anti-Hindu messages were spray-painted on the building's walls. The threat said, Hindus go back. Apart from this, the temple's water pipes were damaged. The water supply was cut. An investigation has been launched into this incident, which has sparked anger. There are concerns over the safety of religious minorities in the country, especially as this attack comes amidst a growing trend in the United States. Hindu temples are being vandalized in the country. This is a systematic hate crime against the Hindu community in America. In January this year, a Hindu temple was vandalized in California. It was defaced with anti-India graffiti. On September 17th, less than 10 days ago, another BAPS temple was vandalized, this time in New York. Hate messages were spray-painted on the temple's entrance. They were directed at India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was visiting the US just days later. Indian diplomats demanded strong action against the perpetrators. The vandalism was condemned by US lawmakers, more than two dozen of them. Yet, the vile act of hate continues. In response to the religious intolerance, this morning the Hindu community came together. They gathered for a prayer ceremony and took comfort in togetherness. They were joined by Stephanie Nguyen, a California State Assembly member, Mayor Bobby Singh Allen and Police Chief Matthew Tamayo. The prayer meeting was a symbol of unity. But is it enough? Ahead of US elections, hate crimes in the country seem to be going from bad to worse. Congressman Ro Khanna has called these incidents appalling and morally wrong. Physician and politician Ami Bera says there is no place for religious bigotry. But the Hindu community wants to see tangible action. The US goes to polls in a couple of weeks. This is the same nation where politics is so polarizing, it's dividing people, where extremism is getting oxygen. And the back-to-back -back incidents continue to reignite concerns that religious minorities are clearly not as safe in the country as the U.S. claims. Who is America's top ally in West Asia? At number one is Israel, as evident from their support for the war. But Saudi Arabia is a close number two because the kingdom is a package. You get the Arab world, you get the Muslim world, and you get a whole lot of oil. But looks like Joe Biden is looking to diversify. This week, he hosted the president of the UAE at the White House, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, aka MBZ. He is the first UAE president to visit the White House, and Biden was all praise. UAE is a nation of trailblazers, always looking, always looking at the future, always making big bets, and there's something our countries have in common, and our people have. I would like to reaffirm that the United Arab Emirates has a firm and unwavering commitment to work with the United States of America for the sake of deepening the strategic partnership between our two nations. Joe Biden also made an announcement. He designated the UAE as a major defense partner. Now, this is a rare move. Only one other country has been given this tag, and that is India. But what does it mean? Basically, more defense cooperation, things like your joint military exercises, more defense deals, and sharing of crucial technology. Now, the simple question is why? Why has Biden done this now? Like I said, maybe to diversify. Saudi Arabia has long been America's trusted ally in West Asia. The UAE has also been an ally. But Riyadh had a special place in U.S. policy. Under Joe Biden, that has changed. While campaigning for, for his presidency, he promised to turn Riyadh into a pariah. He toned down that rhetoric as president, but the relationship remains frozen. 
In fact, Riyadh has moved closer to China. They're welcoming Chinese technology to diversify their economy. And don't forget the human rights. The U.S. has mostly ignored these concerns, but it becomes a bit tough when critics are killed and chopped up in embassies. Which brings us to the UAE. They've been a lot easier to deal with. Let's look at three instances. Number one, China. Beijing was reportedly investing in the Abu Dhabi port. They were also involved in the UAE's 5G setup. The U.S. complained about these deals, so Abu Dhabi cancelled them. Instead, American companies are now investing. Microsoft is pumping $1.5 billion into the UAE's AI infrastructure. That's one example. Number two is Israel. The UAE signed the Abraham Accords in 2020. They've normalized relations with Israel. But Saudi Arabia is yet to do that. And finally, number three, oil. You may remember the inflation crisis in 2022 and 2023. Joe Biden pleaded with Saudi Arabia to increase oil output, to reduce the oil prices. He even flew down to Riyadh and met the Saudi crown prince. But the kingdom refused. Again, guess who did not? The UAE. They increased their output by 200,000 barrels per day. Even culturally, the UAE is more flexible. Their cities are largely cosmopolitan and they're more welcoming to minorities. Certainly better than Saudi Arabia or Qatar. Is that why Biden is wooing them? Well, it's certainly possible. The UAE already hosts a US military base. Around 3,500 American soldiers are stationed there. So it's a great location to keep tabs on West Asia. But what's in it for the UAE? Well, Abu Dhabi has its own rivalry with Riyadh. It's, it's a sort of an intra-Arab rivalry. Some of it dates back to border issues and dynastic politics, but the major ones are recent. Like who will dominate the oil market? Who will get more foreign investment? And who will leave the Arab world? It's a bit like a prestige battle. We saw that in Yemen. Saudi Arabia and the UAE had deployed troops together, but in 2019, the UAE pulled out. Reports say the Saudi crown prince was not happy about this. He apparently accused MBZ of backstabbing him. So the rivalry is very much there. It's just not open hostility. And that's where the U.S. comes in. America has modern technology and cutting-edge weapons. The UAE needs those to challenge Riyadh. We're talking things like 5G and AI. Saudi Arabia is getting them from China, so the UAE is getting them from the U.S., we could be looking at a major realignment in West Asia. Let's see how it unfolds. As we speak, the United Nations General Assembly is in session. Leaders from all over the world have made their way to New York to represent their countries, take part in debates and discussions, and address some of the most challenging issues that the world faces today. One of these issues is the fate of Afghan women. Ever since the Taliban took over Afghanistan in 2021, women have had their voices silenced, quite literally. The issue was highlighted by the American actor Meryl Streep, and her speech is going viral. Take a look at this first. Today, in Kabul, a female cat has more freedoms than a woman. A cat may go sit on her front stoop and feel the sun on her face. She may chase a squirrel into the park a squirrel has more rights than a girl in Afghanistan today because the public parks have been closed to women and girls by the Taliban. A bird may sing in Kabul, but a girl may not, and a woman may not in public. She's right. Afghan women cannot show their faces in public. They're not allowed to talk out loud anymore, and the Taliban say no singing. These restrictions are over and above the earlier ones, which prevented Afghan women from receiving an education beyond the sixth grade. It's a revolting situation. So raising awareness is necessary. Meryl Streep has put her weight behind the, the Afghan women's cause. And that is definitely the need of the hour to ensure that their plight is not forgotten. That alone would have been one good thing to come out of this UN session. But then something else happened. It seems four Western nations got inspired and decided to sue the Taliban at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. These four Western champions of justice are Canada, Australia, Germany and the Netherlands. 
Yes, all four of them are countries that sent troops to Afghanistan during the so-called war on terror. It seems they're done suing their own war crime whistleblowers and now they want some more Afghan-linked legal action. But let's put aside that irony for a second and look at the case that these nations are pursuing. The four Western countries are suing the Taliban for violating a human rights treaty called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Think about that name for a second. Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Does that sound like something the Taliban would sign? Of course not. They never signed this convention. But the Western-backed Afghan government did back in the year 2003. Now here's the kicker. These four Western countries are suing the Taliban for violating a convention they did not sign. And these countries have not recognized the Taliban government. They don't think of it as legitimate. But they say that since the Taliban control Afghanistan, they're obliged to uphold old treaties. Again, think about that for a second. According to these four Western nations, if a criminal gang overruns a police station, the criminals will automatically become cops and they can be sued for not patrolling the neighborhood. That's basically what their case is. Look at the foreign ministers from these four nations, so pleased with the mental gymnastics they've just pulled off, denying the Taliban legitimacy but demanding that they do the job of a legitimate government. And this is, a, is not even the best part. These four Western countries are suing the Taliban at the ICJ, really, the ICJ, a so-called world court, with no enforcement powers. Let's look at how that will go. First, the Taliban has six months for arbitration to come to a settlement with these four Western nations, which basically means six months wasted. After that, the ICJ will take up the case. The court spends about four years on a case on average. So four years of talk, while Afghan women remain silent. Then there will be an ICJ verdict. Let's assume that the court finds the Taliban guilty. What will the judges do? Will they intensify their hand-wringing? Send a strongly worded letter, perhaps? What else can they do? Remember, they have no enforcement powers. The whole premise is ridiculous. The ICJ is not even a paper tiger. It's a paper sheep to be shepherded by the UN Security Council. In theory, the Security Council can try and enforce the ICJ's rulings. But who's on that council? Countries like China. Beijing wants minerals from Kabul. So, of course, they will veto anything that the ICJ says. All the Taliban has to do is bribe China with a mine or two and they can continue to oppress Afghan women for generations to come. The thing is, Afghanistan needs real action, not Western nations trying to role play as the four horsemen of women empowerment and definitely not another farce at the ICJ. Afghan women deserve better. For our last story tonight, let's talk about the land where time seems to stand still, the land with a relentless sun and rippling sand. I'm talking about the Sahara Desert. It spans across North Africa. It's the largest hot desert in the world, one of the driest regions on Earth, but maybe not so much anymore. The Sahara is blooming with life. NASA has released satellite images. They capture the desert's green shift with plant life popping up everywhere, adding color to the typically arid land. Why is this happening? Is it a cause for celebration or a sign of devastation? Our next report tells you. This is the Sahara Desert. It spans across North Africa with an area of more than 9 million square kilometers. It is the largest hot desert in the world. But for scientists, the Sahara is like a large open-air museum, where the shifting sands and the weathering bring up ancient landscapes from a bygone era. Did you know that thousands of years ago, the Sahara was nothing like it is today? It was home to lush greenery, packed with lakes and rivers, even forests. So the Sahara is an immense data bank. It can tell us what climate change can do to a region, how it can affect landscapes and civilizations, how it can turn a savanna brimming with life into one of the hottest and driest places on Earth because today we are witnessing this shift once again. But this time, climate change is taking the Sahara back to its roots. NASA has released satellite images of the desert. They show a dramatic transformation. 
the Sahara is shifting green. You can see the influx of color from space. Over the past few months, the region has witnessed heavy rainfall. So plants are growing across the desert, especially in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia and Libya. These are generally treeless landscapes. They rarely receive any rain. But now, green shoots are sprouting up across these regions. Now, considering the region's history, this is not completely unusual. The Sahara looks like a desert, but when a deluge of rain pours in, everything starts greening quickly. Plant life starts to sprout. Nature responds readily. What's unusual is the rate at which this is happening. The flora may look pretty, but this is a devastating sign of the things to come. Climate change is changing the tracks of storms. In Africa, it has moved the storm system northward. So rainfall in the region has become stronger and more frequent. Within a matter of days, North Africa received a year's worth of rainfall. So typically dry areas like Niger, Chad, Sudan, Libya and Egypt have received more than 400% of their typical rainfall since July. Now there is catastrophic flooding. About 4 million people have been severely impacted and the Sahara Desert is about six times wetter than it should be. Meanwhile, because the storms have shifted, some countries that should be getting more rainfall, like Nigeria and Cameroon, are getting fewer rains. They received between 50 to 80 percent of their typical rainfall since July. Scientists say this is only the beginning. Climate change is disrupting seasons, making natural disasters worse and inviting major consequences. So while the Sahara looks fascinating with its newfound greenery, this is no cause for celebration. Born in Karachi, studied at Oxford and leading a political party at 36. That's Bilawal Bhutto Zardari's resume. His mother was a prime minister and his father was president. So Bilawal had to fight his way to the top. But kudos to him because he has never let his famous surname weigh him down. He's done that with his own speeches. You see, Bilawal's Urdu is a bit weak. He has said so himself. He's a lot more comfortable speaking English. But that, was, that has never stopped him from making complicated references. This time he was using the Urdu version of an English idiom. Give someone an inch and they'll take a mile. Safe to say, he got it wrong. Hey, y'all, come look at this. बारिश आता है तो पानी आता है तब ज्यादा बारिश आता है तो ज्यादा पानी आता है के खान साहब ने तो पूरा टोचा खाना खाली कर दिया टोचा खाना क्या है मैं समझाऊं तो कैसे समझाऊं कि टांगे कांपने में और काम पे टांगने में फर्क क्या है हां व्हाट ब्रो व्हाट आर यू टॉकिंग अबाउट मैन एंड नाउ इट्स टाइम फॉर वेंटेड शॉट्स इमेजेस दैट टेल द स्टोरी अ न्यू वीडियो कैप्चर्स द नॉर्दर्न लाइट्स ओवर द यूएस स्टेट ऑफ वाशिंगटन ड्यूरिंग अ विजिट टू लक्समबर्ग द पोप शेयर्स एन एडोरेबल मोमेंट विद द कंट्रीज यंग प्रिंस and Hong Kong welcomes a pair of giant pandas from China with a grand ceremony. Finally, on, on this day in history, in 1946, the first Tintin magazine was published. It was created by a Belgian comic strip artist, popularly known as Erge. The comics follow the adventures of fictional Belgian reporter Tintin and his canine sidekick, Snowy. Till date, it remains one of the most popular and influential comics globally. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.